How has this Christmas season been going for you on a spiritual level? Do you feel like you guys have been able to behold the boy in the manger? Have you been amazed and thinking about the miracle of Christmas? Or thinking about what the coming of Jesus has meant for you in your life? To be honest, I've been struggling with that this year. Uh, it's been hard to focus on Jesus this Christmas. Feels like there's a thousand distractions around me calling for my attention. And I think you and I get so easily uh, distracted by so many things. There's the things that we're worrying about that distract us. There's things that are problems in our life that distract us. They take our attention away. There's the things that we're behind on, the tasks that we need to complete that distract us. It's so easy to get distracted even by happy things this time of year, by the joy of being together with other people or thinking about being with your friends and family around the Christmas holiday. Even blessings can distract us from what matters most. Now, I'm not coming up here telling you anything new this morning. You know that the reason for the season is Jesus. The time before Christmas that we have each year is called Advent. Advent is a time for us to prepare ourselves for Christmas as Christians. It's a time to be savoring Jesus so that by the time we actually get to Christmas and all the busyness of that day, our heart is ready to adore him. So Advent is a time to come and behold the boy in the manger. And when you behold something, it's not just that you're noticing it. It's that you're looking intently at it. You're giving it your full attention. That's the kind of attention we need to be giving to Jesus in this Christmas season to prepare ourselves for Christmas Day. We need to behold the child, our King, our Savior, and remember, again, the true story of Christmas. So that's what I want to help us do together this morning. We're going to behold the newborn king again. We're going to give him our attention. We're going to remember who he is and why he came for us so we can rediscover the wonder of Christmas. So join me now as we ask God to awaken our sleepy and distracted hearts with a beautiful and compelling picture of our king. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to see Jesus in a new and more powerful way this morning, that his, that his glory would be revealed to us that we would delight ourselves in Jesus and what his coming means for us, that we would prepare ourselves in this way for Christmas, which is just around the corner. Be with your people today. Feed our souls. Lead us to joy in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Two things I want to help you to see and savor about Jesus this Christmas. The first is Jesus' glory, his true and amazing identity. And the second is his grace to you, what this little boy came to give you. Jesus was no ordinary boy. He was fully human, but his glory was literally out of this world. John points us to four facets of Jesus' glory here in these verses. The first thing we see is that Jesus' glory is divine glory. Now, try to wrap your mind around this one. Even before Jesus was born, Jesus was glorious. And Jesus had forever been praised by the angels in heaven. Take a look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. But John and the other disciples came to see as they saw Jesus minister before them, was nothing less than the glory of the eternal word of God. In verse 1, John starts his gospel with an echo of Genesis, but he twists it. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So before there was a universe, there was and had always been the word, the word was with God. The word was God. But then on Christmas morning, the word became flesh. 
He became one of us. He became a human being. He lived among us. He ministered to us. People were able to see the words eternal glory with their own two eyes. Sean's saying that Jesus' story, it did not start on Christmas, and it did not start nine months before that. There is no beginning to Jesus' story. He is the divine pre-existent word who left the praises of heaven to come to us. And he came to us in this most wonderfully intimate and powerful way by actually becoming one of us. God has not waited in heaven for us to find our way to him. God has come down to us. The eternal word has entered the universe that he created. And he has done this by becoming human. We will never finish exploring the glory of the incarnation, the glory of Christmas. But one implication is clear, at least. If Jesus is none other than the eternal word, who is God himself, then clearly Jesus has authority over us. He's not simply older than us. Jesus is infinitely greater than us. John the Baptist made this very same point in his teaching. John mentions this in verse 15. John bore witness of, uh, about him, that's John the Baptist, and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, was born after me, ranks before me because he was before me. So Jesus doesn't just outrank John the Baptist. He ranks above all of us. He ranks over everyone. Jesus is our maker. Jesus' glory is nothing less than divine. Second, Jesus' glory is the glory of God's only Son. John continues in verse 14, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. The Word is the Son. Jesus didn't just appear here on earth. He was sent here by his heavenly Father. Now, the two of them, they had always had the best kind of father-son relationship. Jesus, or the word, was his father's one and only son, his beloved child. It had always been that way. Until the day when the father sent his son away, sending him to us to save us from our sins by enduring the full wrath of his father against our sin, just so that we, people like us, could be reconciled to the Father and adopted into that family. Now, this relationship between Jesus and his Father, it is the closest father-son relationship the world has ever seen. It was so close that even when Jesus was sleeping in the manger, get this, the Father was actually dwelling in Jesus. And Jesus was actually dwelling in his heavenly father. Jesus could say things like this. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. So get this, if you've seen Jesus's glory, you have seen the Father's glory, because Jesus reveals his Father's glory wherever he's shining. Whoever has seen him has seen his Father. They were Father and Son, but they were more than that. They were, and they still are, one being. In Christ, the true God became one of us. He became fully human, even as he was still fully God. And that means that the glory of that little boy was the very same glory that had created the world and parted the Red Sea. 
Now, of course, this glory isn't something you can just see directly with your eyes and in the immediate sense. When God became human, the brightness of Jesus's glory, it was put under a veil, you could say. So when Jesus was walking around, people could be right next to him and still not really recognize his glory for what it was. Now, we don't have any indication that Jesus's glory was shining in any visible way there in the manger. And yet, those who could see him in his true glory could recognize him and praise God, praising Jesus, worshiping him even. The wise men and the others, they saw Jesus' glory by faith and not by sight. They did not see a glowing human and then draw the conclusion. They saw what would look like an ordinary looking baby. But by faith, they could see his glory. By faith, they understood who this boy was. And that led them to worship. Jesus is worthy of your worship just as much as the Father is worthy of your worship. Jesus is the glorious one. He is the divine word. He is our God. And also, he is God's one and only son. He is the Father's gift to us. God gave us his son on Christmas. And Jesus is worthy of our full attention and our heartfelt worship every single day. So don't let yourself go through the motions again this Christmas. Go to Jesus in his word. See him. Recognize who he is. Savor who he is. Find some quiet place in your week to behold him, to see who he is, to marvel at his glory until your heart starts to worship. Then once you start to worship, keep going. Make this week a week of worship for you in your life as a Christian. Now, if you're wondering where to start and you have a hard time wrapping your mind around these abstract concepts of who Jesus is, then, hey, just focus on things that are concrete, easier to understand. Reflect on this fact that the kind of person Jesus ultimately became is the same person that was there in the manger. That even as you saw his life play out later in terms of his character, that that is that baby. And so if you want to see his glory, look at the, the glory of the person that he became. He hadn't changed at all. He was always that person. He was always perfect. Think about then how the adult Jesus treated others, how he served others, how he took our sins on his shoulders and died in our place. All of these actions reveal the man that Jesus was. They show us his glory before our eyes. And this brings us to a third facet of his glory. Jesus is full of glorious grace. Look again at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John describes Jesus' glory as glory that is full of grace. Jesus may be our eternal, omnipotent God, but that does not make Jesus stingy or cold toward us. Jesus overflows with glorious grace. He is, after all, the very same God who revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, I'm not saying that was Jesus himself who appeared before Moses, but Jesus is God, and there's only one God. And the one true God appeared before Moses on Mount Sinai. And Moses said, God, show me your glory. And you remember what God says. He does not say, okay, I'll show you my glory, Moses. I'm going to split that mountain in half. Nor does he say, okay, Moses, I'm going to tell you word for word what the next 100 people are going to say to you today. Here's what God actually says. Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. Moses says, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will pro proclaim before you my name, the Lord. When Moses asked to see God's glory, God showed him his goodness. Because that 
is where God's glory really shines. Sure, God is almighty. Sure, he's preexistent. Sure, he is all-knowing. But the heart of God's glory is his heart. He is absolutely good. That is his character. That is his heart. God is so good to his people. He is so good even to those who are not his people. He is always good. So when God came here and he became one of us, he came in the fullness of his goodness. He came full of grace. Now, when John calls Jesus full of grace and truth here, he's alluding to this interaction on Mount Sinai. Because what happens is God says, I will show you my goodness. And then this is what God says, Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what John's alluding to here, as he declares Jesus to be full of grace and truth. Now, it sounds a bit different because it's being translated from a different language, but the connection is intentional. John is telling us that Jesus is the very same God who appeared to Moses on Sinai. That Jesus also abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. That he is full of grace and truth. In fact, Jesus is so full of grace that he overflows with grace. Jesus is relentlessly and amazingly gracious with other people because he is a God of steadfast love. Jesus not only loves and commits himself to his people, but when they fail in their duty to him, when they really fail him, Jesus forgives his people. He is still faithful to his people. He simply refuses to give up on his people. That is his grace to us. That is the Lord we know. He's full of grace. Is he not a much better savior and king than we deserve? Do we deserve that kind of treatment? I mean, you and I feel him so often, but he is still so faithful toward us. He is so gracious with us. He does not go around giving everybody what they, des what they deserve. He goes around giving us better than we deserve. He gives us second chances, third chances, hundredth chances. He gives us healing. He gives us hope. He gives us atonement for our sins against him. He is welcoming rebels into a loving relationship with him. Jesus' heart is so full of grace that grace is continually pouring out of him and blessing others. And this goodness that he has is at the very heart of his divine glory. Fourth, his glory is also full of truth, as John says in verse 14. This is what he means. Jesus is God's truest communication to us. There is no clearer picture of God we can have than Jesus. The book of Hebrews makes the same point. It starts like this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That is who he is. Jesus is our God. And he has come for us. You want to see the glory of God? Behold the boy in the manger. As John says in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Through Jesus' life of ministry, through his interactions with others, through Jesus' decision to go to the cross to die for our sins, the truth about God was revealed. It was overflowing in the world through God's Son because Jesus bears the full radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of God's nature. Jesus has revealed 
the invisible God to us. And that's part of the miracle of Christmas. And he has done this in the most powerful way possible, not by writing a book to tell us about God, not by making a movie about God, but by coming to us in the flesh, in human flesh, and dwelling among us. If you want to understand the mysteries of who God is and what God is like, he's right here in the Gospels. If you want to understand what it means to be a good person in life, you want to understand what true glory really is, if you want to understand what wisdom is, what good leadership looks like, what love entails, what it means to be gracious or merciful or forgiving or generous, just look at Jesus. Jesus has brought God to us in living color. He is not simply the image of God. He is our God himself. He's come to us. Not to destroy us because of our sin, but to bless us in spite of it. He comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is found. Because he is a God who overflows with grace. This is what God loves to do. He cannot help himself. He is full of grace. He loves to bless us abundantly. He loves to take care of us. He loves to give generously to us. We need to remember and rejoice over the amazing grace that Jesus has shown to us. We need to remember that Jesus himself is God's greatest gift that he's ever given to anyone. Look what John says in verses 16 and 17. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, God is drawing us into life's greatest blessing, which is to know God, the glorious one, in the context of a real and loving and personal relationship with him. In the past, God related to his people under the terms of the law covenant, the old covenant. In his grace, God had made himself known to Abraham. He had made Abraham and his descendants, his people. He had graciously revealed himself to them in the law so they could read his words and they could savor his goodness. But now God has done something even better. In and through Jesus Christ, God has blessed his people with grace that is even more powerful and poignant. Jesus has given us an even more beautiful picture of who our God is than we had in the law. The grace God gives to us in and through Jesus is far beyond the grace that the law provides. Jesus says in verse 16 that from Christ's fullness, we have received grace upon grace, literally grace in place of grace. Here's what he's saying. God was profoundly gracious with his people under the law covenant. But in and through Jesus, the God of grace has truly outdone himself. He's given a grace far better even than the grace that he showed his people Israel. Because in and through Jesus, God has begun a new covenant relationship with his people, a covenant in which he forgives all of our sins and welcomes us into his glorious kingdom and even adopts us as his own children. The new covenant is an even better covenant. It is even more gracious. And John says it comes to us through Christ's fullness as a result of Christ's goodness. He is so good. He is so full of grace that Jesus gave his very life to save our lives. He took our place. He endured God's wrath against our sins so we could be spared from that wrath, so we could be forgiven. He died our death so we might live forever and live out our remaining days with the glorious hope that before too long, we too will be able to see and savor Jesus in the flesh. This grace isn't just grace that's given in the past. It's not just grace that we're looking ahead to in the future. God is also pouring out this grace upon his people day after day. Listen to what Paul says about this everyday grace in Christ that is coming to us in ways that were far beyond how it came to the Israelites in the Old Covenant. This is 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 18. Paul says, but their minds were hardened. 
For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. Jesus came to set your vision free. He came to remove the veil in front of your face so that with that veil removed, you could behold God's true glory. The veil was so thick that you were essentially living in darkness, but then the veil was removed. And as you gaze at the brightest light ever, what happens is this light illuminates your face now, and you come to reflect this light in the darkness of this world. This bright light is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is so powerful that it is changing our lives. This too is grace. As we, with unveiled face, are beholding the glory of our Lord, and then we ourselves start to take on that very same glory from one degree of glory to another, more and more and more we take it on. In a sense, then, Jesus came here to give us his glory, to glorify us, in a sense, by turning us into people who are gloriously good like him. In Jesus, God became like us, so we could become like God. Now, we don't become gods, of course, but we do become like God. God is making his people gloriously good like him. He is turning them into people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we, too, might then overflow with grace toward others and be a light in the darkness that brings glory to the light of the world. And this happens as we, with our faces unveiled by Jesus, behold the true glory and grace of our Lord. God is offering you a gift this morning, the gift of his son, the gift of the salvation that Jesus paid for in blood. God's offering it to you free of charge. You don't need to do anything to prove yourself to God or to earn it. All you need is faith. Look at verses 12 and 13. John says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God is offering you a new life of joy as his child. He is offering you a clean slate with total forgiveness. And he loves you so much that he gave his own son over to death to make this possible for you. And because of that, if you want to embrace the gift of salvation this morning, you can. I would encourage you to come up and talk to me after the service. We can sort out the details of what that looks like or how you can respond in faith to Jesus and receive that gift of salvation yourself. For someone who has done that, you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've embraced this free gift of salvation. I, I exhort you, don't lose sight of your hope this Christmas. Don't miss this opportunity. You see, on that day when you come face to face with the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, he is going to delight you so much 
that you will worship him from the very depths of who you are. And you will want nothing more than to keep doing this forever because it will become the most rapturous experience you've ever had in your life. That is exactly what you will get to do from that day forward. Your heart will always be full when you're with Jesus. Your joy will never run cold. Your faith will never waver because his glory will never cease to amaze you, not even after a million years. So look, you've got one week until Christmas. Use it. Start beholding him now, this week, so that by the time Sunday comes around, you're going to be ready to rejoice at the coming of the Lord. You can do this individually by finding an Advent devotional and taking time each day to read from the Bible and reflect on the glory and grace of Jesus. Uh, you can get some free Advent devotionals on uh, the desiringgod.org website. I'd recommend uh, the Advent devotionals there. Or instead of doing it individually, you could try to do it in a small group setting, say at a family dinner or with friends. Take time to share together what you love and you admire about Jesus. And pray that God would help you see the true glory of the incarnation this Christmas. And also encourage you to come out next weekend so you can celebrate here with your spiritual family. We've got a combined service on Christmas Eve at 730. We're going to be singing carols with joyful anticipation. And then we'll have a Christmas morning service at 11 o'clock where we'll rejoice together over the birth of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You got one week to get ready for Christmas. Don't forget to get ready spiritually. Use this week to reflect on the true glory of that boy in the manger and the amazing grace that he came to give you. Keep striving for a little glimpse of Jesus until his glory and his grace become your greatest delight. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we know that we are so poor in doing this. We're so weak. We have such a hard time focusing our minds on Jesus. We are so easily distracted this time of year. We need your grace to help us treasure Jesus. We need you to open our eyes to see his glory. We need you to give us the reminders we need and the promptings we need to not forget about this, but to actually pursue this as a priority this morning. So we pray that you'd ask us, uh, we pray that you'd work by your spirit to, to lead us, to guide us, to show us Christ, to help us behold in his face the glory of God so we might recognize who he is and praise him for who he is and delight in the gift that he is. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.